Hi, today's lecture is about the management of impacted lower third molars. This is the first part that deals with the terminology, classifications, and the indication for this surgery. The second part will deal with the surgical steps regarding the impacted lower third molars. So, in the beginning, what is the difference between an impacted tooth and an erupted tooth? An impacted tooth is a tooth that is failed to erupt within the specified period of time, while unerupted teeth would include the teeth within the development time and teeth that is deemed to be impacted. Regarding the third molar, the time specified for its eruption is between 18 and 25 years. After 25 years, the tooth is considered to be impacted. We have different theories regarding the impactions. These are would justify what the impaction occur. We have the phylogenetic theory, Mendelian theory, and the Nodin theory. Regarding the phylogenetic theory, it entails that the human jaws become smaller with successive generations. So as the generation becomes one after the another, the jaws tend to be smaller, and the, hence the third molar is the last tooth to erupt, impaction occurs because the, the third molar wouldn't find a space to erupt within the right position. Mendelian theory, it entails about a genetic predisposition for the impaction. For example, if we have one of the parents have small jaws and the other parents will have large teeth, their children will have small jaws with large teeth, so impaction will occur in the last teeth that erupt within the arch. And third molar is the last teeth to erupt, and therefore impaction can occur. Note in theory, it entails that the growth of the jaw is stimulated by mastication, and since the modern diet is considerably considered to be softer than the, uh, what the old people tend to eat, so modern societies will have smaller jaws. And all this will cause the impaction to occur. Classification of the impacted third molars, lower third molars. Why do we classify these impacted teeth? Classification would allow the communication between one healthcare provider and the another would be, make it more easy. And also classification can help to document these cases and also can um, give a hint about the surgical difficulties that can be encountered by the operator. We have different classification. The first one we have here is the winter classification. Winter classification simply compares the long excess of the third molar in relation to the long excess of the adjacent teeth. And for this, we have different subclassifications. We have mesioangular, vertical, distoangular, horizontal, and transverse. The mesioangular is the most common one, and it is considered the easier one to manage. The second most common would be the vertical, and the most difficult one to manage is the distoangular. We'll come into this in more details. This is the mesioangular, and this is vertical. So if we compare the long axis of the third, lower third molar with the adjacent tooth, we have it like the third molar in a mesial angulation. So it's termed to as mesial angular in comparison to the long axis of the adjacent tooth. A vertical, we have the long axis parallel to each other, and this tooth termed to as a vertical, vertically impacted lower third molar. This is the most common one as we said, and the easier to manage. This is the second most common impaction. Distoangular, we have the long axis of the third molar distally angulated from the adjacent tooth. This is considered the difficult one to manage because the line of withdrawal for the extraction of the lower third molar will be run within the external, uh, within, sorry, within the ramus, within the extended ramus. So it will make the extraction very difficult. 
and also this will need a more significant bone removal to allow the extraction of the tooth. In addition, we have the roots of the third molar in close proximity to the roots of the adjacent tooth, making it difficult to extract without damaging the adjacent tooth. A horizontal impaction, on the other hand, we have the long axis perpendicular on the long axis of the adjacent tooth. The last one would be the transverse. Here, the third molar would be in a horizontal angulation in comparison to the adjacent tooth. So, in some instance, it would give a bull eye on the radiograph, these concentric rings. It could be in a buccolingual direction, so the crown could be on the buccal side or on the lingual side. Another classification will be the Pale and Grigori classification. This classification can classify the position of the third molar according to its relationship with the mandibular ramus and also can classify the depth of the third molar in comparison with the adjacent tooth. In the first instance, this would classify it position of the third molar in relation to the ramus. We have a class 1, class 2, and a class 3. The more space we have, it is class 1. And the least space we have on where the crown is fully embedded within the ramus, this is class 3. So if we have enough mesiodistal dimension between the ramus and the distal aspect of the second molar to, co to compensate the whole width of the tooth, this is a class 1. If we have half of the tooth within the, or in, within the oral cavity and the other half embedded within the ramus, this is a class 2. And if we have the whole crown embedded within the ramus, this is class 3. Class 3 being the most difficult one because there will be significant amount of the bone need to be removed to allow the exposure of the crown during the extraction, while class 1 would be the easier one to manage. Pearl and Grigori also classifies the relative depth of the third molar in relation to the adjacent tooth. So we have here class A, class B, and class C. And to, to make it easy to be remembered by you, we can say, for example, A, B, C, depth, D for depth. So A, B, C, D for depth. And 1, 2, 3, 4 for ramus. Okay, 1, 2, 3, ramus, and A, B, C, D, depth, D for depth. Okay, so class A, we have the highest portion of the tooth within the occlusal plane of the adjacent teeth. And here we have the highest portion, which is the cusp tip in this instance, is between the occlusal plane and the cervical margin of the tooth. While class C, the highest portion, which is the cusp tip, as we said here in this instance, is below the cervical margin. This is the deepest one as the most difficult one to manage because, as we said, we need more bone to be removed to allow the exposure of the crown, while class A would be the easier one to manage. This is was the classification, and now we deal with the indication. And it has been published by the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in 2015, a guidance for the third molar surgery here you have the link for the full guidance, so if you can want to go to the website and read the full guidance in details. Here we'll deal with the summary of it, which is, the first point is prophylactic removal of the third molar surgery. It said in the guidance that prophylactic removal of an impacted third molar surgery should be discontinued from the dental practice, because in this instance, we we'll deal with the removal of an asymptomatic teeth teeth that doesn't cause any problems. Okay, so why would we avoid removing the third molar in a prophylactic manner? Because we might put the patient in a danger undergoing such a surgery. There is a proximity of the inferior dental nerve in some instance and teeth during the surgery might, the nerve might, during the surgery might get damaged 
and the patient will end up with a numbness within the lower lip. So therefore, this is unnecessary if it is in a prophylactic removal. Sometimes the lingual nerve on the lingual side of the impacted tooth sometimes get damaged as well, and also the patient will have numbness of the tongue, and this is unnecessary in case of a prophylactic removal. In addition, patient will get sometimes bleeding, swelling, and pain post-operatively, and all this can be avoided when we avoid prophylactic removal for the third molars. While the surgical removal should be limited to certain situations which include unrestorable caries, for example, in this situation, if we have a third molar that is extensively carious, patients might have pain, swelling, or something like that caused by this tooth, so it's better to extract it. If we have non-treatable pulpal or periapical pathology, also it's better to extract the tooth. Surgical removal should also be limited to in case of we have cellulitis, an abscess, or osteomyelitis. It's better to extract it. Internal or external resorption of the tooth or adjacent teeth. So in, in this instance, we have this third molar in horizontal direction that causes pressure and resorption of the roots of the adjacent second molar. So it's better to extract the, second, the third molar and then we might refer the patient to a restorative dentist to make any uh, necessary treatment to the adjacent teeth. And sometimes in this instance might be extracted as well. If we have a disease of the follicle, for example a cyst or tumor, it's also an indication for extraction. In this instance, we have this dentigerous cyst that is related to the cementonal junction of the third molar, impacted third molar, so this tooth is indicated for extraction. If we have the tooth that is fractured, like in this instance, fractured crown, and we have the retained roots, it's better to extract them if it's caused any problems. Teeth or a tooth that is impending the surgery, a tooth that prevents the surgery. For example, we have here a mandibular fracture. And sometimes when we have an, an impacted teeth, it makes it difficult to reposition the, the fracture line properly. These teeth can be extracted as well. Tooth involved within the tumor, field of a tumor resection. We have this, in this instance, this radiograph, an amyloblastoma that is related to the third molar. Perichoronitis, there are special indications in the perichoronitis when we consider extraction. Not every single patient that has perichoronitis should undergo a third molar surgery. If it is in a first instance, okay, mild episode of perichoronitis, it's okay. But if it is, unless it is very severe, perichoronitis in the first instance is not considered as an indication. But if we have a recurrent perichoronitis, the patients that have perichoronitis get a proper treatment, perichoronitis have been resolved, and then the patient has another episode of perichoronitis, then we have our indication for extraction. So recurrent perichoronitis is an indication for third molar surgery, while the first episode, unless it was very severe, perichoronitis, the first episode is not indication unless it is severe. That is all the indication for the extraction. Uh, here I have included for you the signs for the proximity for the inferior, inferior dental nerve. When, when we see the radiograph, we have a hint that there is a sign for the proximity. Here you have the reference, which is the radiological prediction of the inferior alveolar nerve injury during third molar surgery. It has been published in 1990 by Root and Shihab. What they have found that there are different signs that is related to inferior dental nerve injury by reviewing uh, radiographs of patients who have who have third molar surgery. Here we have the darkening of the roots. We have the deflection of the roots, so the roots get deflected from the inferior dental nerve, and narrowing of the roots, so the roots appear to be narrower on its apical in its apex 
near the inferior dental nerve. Another sign for the proximity is the darkening of the roots and the bifid apex and the interruption of the white line of the canal. On the panoramic radiographs, we have this radio-opic line that defines the roof and the floor of the inferior dental nerve. If we have this line interrupted by the tooth, this is a sign for the, for the proximity of the inferior dental nerve. Diversion of the canal is also a sign. So if we have the canal that runs in a, a curved line and then it gets diverted from the roots of the third molar, this is a sign for the proximity. We also have the narrowing of the canal. So we have this proper width and then it gets narrowed as it's passed near the third molar. It's also a sign for the inferior dental nerve proximity. This is all the signs, but they have found that three of them is highly associated with inferior dental nerve injury, which is darkening of the roots, interruption of the white line, and the diversion of the canal. Those three signs were strongly associated with third molar uh, complication, which is the inferior dental nerve injury. Nowadays, we have the cone beam CT that can give us a true relationship in the three sections, three D sections, that we have the actual relationship between the roots and the inferior dental nerve. That's all what we have for the first part of this lecture. Thank you. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below.